Welcome to The Next Journey, the adventure travel podcast with me, Andrew St. Pierre White. I'm a prisoner of this. Welcome, everybody, to The Next Journey podcast. My, my guest for the second time this morning is John Canogan. You know, John, we did very well with our previous. The numbers were really good. A lot of people not only liked it, but told us in the comments that they liked what we had to offer. So now, that is back. amazing to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised because I was going to kick off this episode by apologizing to you sincerely for everything I said that was inappropriate last time and also uh, expressing my sympathy that, uh, that your life has come to this so suddenly that you've had to scrape the bottom of the barrel and have me back. Oh, you know, it just shows you, just all of those insults just went straight over my head. I didn't even notice that they were there. So, <laughs> so, so carry on. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't worry me in the slightest. The no, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm really pleased. I think this is a this is a mad adventure, the podcasting thing. I'm I'm absolutely astounded, actually, at how long people are prepared to listen to two old farts having a chat. It's amazing. It is astonishing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think the whole thing is that um, podcasts are listened to, not just watched. So you're doing some gardening, you're doing something in the workshop, and it's two old farts keeping you company, as opposed to a video where you're leaning forward and kind of just absorbing the story and taking it, taking it all in. I think that's the difference. And that's why maybe they'll listen for an hour, but actually only take in about 20 minutes of it or less. Yeah, well, I guess there are plenty of situations in life where one is a uh, captive audience to, you know, inbound information. Like, in a sense, it's it's like talkback radio would be if you could select what the host was going to cover. That's mm. that's the key difference because when I sort of worked on radio, you used to have to move from A to B to C to D and have all this variety so that there were no... Uh, long-winded triggers for people just to channel surf, which was a cardinal sin, obviously. And uh, the exact opposite dynamic pertains to podcasting because we're kind of in a particular groove and the people who are motivated to listen to that know what that groove is off the bat and they, uh, they kind of, they're into that. They don't want to listen to a 12-year-old tell them how to um, hack some mad algorithm in two minutes' time, you know. And the difference also is that a lot of radio and especially television, there are sound bites. You'll have a um, uh, Harry Fisher who does this 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 cooking show did a tele did a some work on television and he, he he was he was saying it was so frustrating to him because they would take three little moments of his cooking process, miss the point entirely, but that's the nature of television. And he said, what actually came out was wrong. That's not how you cook those that steak. That's just three elements of the 10 important ones. So he was frustrated because there were these little sound bites, this kind of thing, YouTube. Hey, we can you can re relax, lean back a bit, adjust the microphone, have a chat with your mate, and people will seem to love it so exactly and what, what exactly are we talking about today you can tell that i've done a uh, high level preparation for our, <laughs> our chat today when i have to ask this question off the bat but what are we going to cover i thought we would have an argument okay and not necessarily a five minute argument maybe the full full half hour because Excellent. i think that we should talk about four-wheel drive warranties uh, accessories and the effect they have on warranties and there are two issues here the one that that can definitely have an effect where the manufacturer is perfectly in their rights to say, uh -uh, you can't do that. And where the manufacturers will lean a little bit one way or the other, if they choose to, given a warranty claim, that could or probably isn't caused by an accessory uh, being fitted. So I want to have a, and I know you and I differ a bit on this, and that's why I think this might be an interesting discussion. Well, I love the concept of arguing, right? Because on TV, which we were just talking about, uh, you know, there's a proxy for entertainment, which is two people of opposing views shouting at one another and a host in the middle and the screen is like split into three different vertical uh, sets, you know. The... And the problem with that is it's not a real argument because there's nothing wrong with actually arguing as long as you do it in 
what I would call a, a dignified way that has foundations in the facts. Because if I'm not absolutely welded on to my point of view and you're not absolutely welded on to your point of view and we discuss where we're coming from on the basis of, well, this has been my experience, blah, then I might actually amend <laughs> some of my thoughts on this issue and you might too. And the our knowledge, therefore, of the whole issue could be advanced in the process as opposed to just standing on, you know, opposite opposite sides of a host and shouting at one another, which is which has become what argument is, but it's not really what it's meant to be. Mm. Yes. So I want to start with, I've got a... I, Oh, I have a go at Toyota quite a bit because I drive their cars and when I have a warranty issue, which is not very often, to be honest with you, um, I always see this decision being made, my fate being decided by somebody who I, to me, is obviously unqualified and may actually know very little about how a car works, deciding on whether this is a warranty claim or not. And the it's, recent yeah. one was... a. Mm. Exactly. It's like a gladiator movie and Caesar's up there and he's going <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, but that's, that's the warranty experience at a dealership. And you know it, that the guy it, making the call is like, oh, yeah. he's, he's not high. It, ex <laughs> it is exactly like that gladiator. You kind of, there's this silence. And you kind of lean back and you think, what is he going to say? What is he going to say? What is he going to say? Uh, is this going to be expensive? It's not. Oh, shit. shit. Because they'll say, oh, Mr. White, it's sorry. It's um, corrosion. Yeah, when it's red dirt. Exactly. When you saw the video, when it was red dirt on an aluminium cased gearbox. Yeah. Hello. And a vehicle that was just over a year old. So that's the absurdity of it. But I have another story, which I'll share later, <clears throat> where Toyota, not the dealer, but Toyota themselves, warranted a, a mate's uh, D4D Hilux engine with 230,000 kilometers on it, six years old, and the engine popped because of a known problem. So I'll get to the details of that. And I thought it's worth sharing the good stories as well. Totally. So let's perhaps start with a, if I've got a four-wheel drive and I've had a most common thing, bull bar, and my engine overheats, and I go to the dealership and I say, my engine's overheated, and they could easily say, yeah, but you fitted something in front of the radiator, mate, not our problem. Yeah, they could what absolutely do, do that, Like, and, and that happens a fair bit. In fact, I just covered a case like this with a D-Max where I Suzu declined to offer any support like consumer law support i think the vehicle was out of warranty but yeah, the consumer law still protects you irrespective of the warranty status of your vehicle so uh, the overarching principle there is that goods and services have to be reasonably durable meaning they have to meet the durability expectations of a reasonable consumer so if your vehicle's like six years old and it comes with a five-year warranty and the engine goes poopy in its trousers for whatever reason and you haven't abused it and you've had it serviced on time, blah, 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 they're supposed to look out for you and offer you a remedy, which in this case would be like a free repair. So happy days. The only problem with this is what happens in practice. And this particular guy did fit a non-genuine accessory bull bar and when you looked at it, the air intake, like the major part of the, the bottom part of the air intake was actually blocked by the new mounting location for the number plate. And he also had a dirty big light bar uh, that was occluding the airflow for the upper part of it. And they went on to say that, you know, the, this interferes with the engine operation over time and that's why you've got a hole in one of your pistons now kind of thing. And whether or not that's true is sort of a matter over here, but you could spend a lot of money uh, verifying or uh, disproving their hypothesis and probably it would cost you more than a new engine to to do that one way or the other. And if you spend that money, you're rolling the dice, aren't you? Because if you spent about the same amount of money replacing the engine, at least then you'd certainly have a new engine kind of thing. So uh, 
I I get how the law is supposed to work if a, if a product or a service that you fit to your car is not fit for purpose and causes a failure like that, then that's on the designer and installer of that particular component and the manufacturer is not really liable for it. But the real problem here is you're a consumer, you don't have endless resources, you don't have a ton of money, and you can end up easily in a situation where the manufacturer of the aftermarket product goes, dude, that's not on us. And the manufacturer of the vehicle goes, dude, that's not on us. And then you're in the middle with a busted vehicle and you have to fix this situation somehow. And the pragmatic fix usually involves you getting your hand out and putting it in your wallet and it's never pleasant. <clears throat> so there is a, we are as four-wheel drive accessory as four-wheel drive users and owners, and we accessorize our vehicles, we are responsible, actually, at the end of the day. Because if you think about it, it might be a bull bar supplied by, let's see, one of the best ARB <clears throat> bars. They're beautifully designed, well-made, good company, lots of research and R&D into their products. I'd fit one of their products because I know. Okay, so then I say, great. Okay, I'm I'm backed by ARB, and I've got my Suzu, and it's working fine. Oh, let's go. I need to put some lights on. <clears throat> my mates have got lights all over their thing. I'm going to start with a big fat bull bar. <clears throat> and they're going to put it right in front of the radiator <laughs> because that's easy to wire up. And um, th they put it there. And then their mates come and say, yeah, but have you seen these? Two? Oh, sure, that, I need those two. So they put some more and then they put some more. And then they're driving through tall grass and they think, oh, OK, um, I need to... Um, I need to put a grass net to stop the, because I know, I need to put a grass net in front of my radiator because I need to protect it from grass seeds getting clogged into the radiator. I am being responsible. But now I have three lights, a bull bar, a winch, and how is the air going to cool the engine? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, I take your point in that owners of vehicles who modify them in this incremental way are without doubt responsible to some extent for the knock-on effects of those modifications. And you can't expect a vehicle manufacturer to say, oh, that's a shame that you've got uh, holes in piston crowns two, three, and four, and that's going to be a new engine that's going to cost 20 grand. We'll just look after that because it's absolutely not their responsibility. The failure is not attributable in many cases to a design defect with the engine. But if you, it'd be like driving it uh, on the worst day ever in Dubai at the heat of, in, in the hottest day of the, of the hottest month continuously for the whole, you know, operational lifespan of that vehicle, just because you've lost so much forced convection through the radio, right? And it's, it's difficult, I think, because what owners essentially do is they make these significant engineering decisions without any real capacity for R&D. They are significant engineering decisions. That's absolutely correct. And people just don't realise that they're significant because perhaps they don't have that engineering or that, that their brain that says, well, if I do that, then the, the following consequences might occur. So it's, it's an education thing. There's all this testing that uh, manufacturers do in hot weather. Like, it's not trivial testing. They get uh, they get their vehicles and they hook them up to a trailer that's essentially got a dynamometer on it, like an electrical generator and a bank of resistors. It's designed just to be hard to haul. And then they might do this in the Northern Territory in the middle of summer and they drive at 100 k's an hour for, I don't know, some period of time, 40 minutes or something, and then they've got a tent set up on the side of the road, and it's just a heat-soaked tent. So, you know, after this incredibly hard towing exercise against this electrical resistance that simulates going up a hill like this, they pull into this heat-soaked tent and just let the whole car soak in the heat that it's bleeding off. And they try and identify by manufacturing these worst-case operational scenarios and they try and identify the failure mechanisms so that they can head them off in practice. But the, the, it's like the better mousetrap. Humanity always seems to stump up a better idiot. And maybe that's the wrong term because the people doing the modifications are not idiots. They've got the best intentions. Even if they're just trying to fit into a club and fit the right fashion accessories so that they look the part, these intentions are not 
stupid. They're, they're, they're not an example of being an idiot, but there are unwitting mistakes getting made and it ends up costing people thousands of dollars. Like they spend thousands and thousands of dollars in the aftermarket industry and the, the industry benefits from that. And I think in some cases there's uh, an obligation to provide some level of guidance when the punter with the cash has absolutely no idea and is obviously hell-bent on unwittingly shooting himself in the foot. And this is the thing. They, they do it unwittingly because they don't understand the effect of certain things. But also, I mean, even I have to guess. And, and, and I've got a lot of experience, but I'm still guessing. I'm not an engineer and I don't have testing equipment. I'll oh, give dude, you an example. Dude, me- I've got an engineering degree and... Yeah without having an actual program, like a testing program with protocols established, guess what I'm doing? I'm guessing, yeah. right? That's that's yeah. all you can do. It's not like uh, being an engineer is not a superpower. You know, it's, it's like, well, we have to test this. And the testing is long and drawn out and boring and expensive, you know? And if you take, if you separate the engineer from the testing, he's just hopefully capable of making a, maybe this much better guess than you, you know, maybe. Mm. And and sometimes not as good a guess as someone with a ton of experience doing modifications in a particular area. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think you'll appreciate this. It was a troop carrier that I had, my first troop carrier in South Africa. It had the 1HZ, um, 4.2, uh, normally aspirated motor. And to get a little bit of oomph out of this thing, some people fitted turbochargers and the engine, mainly the piston crowns, were just not suitable for it. And if you overboosted the engine, they would last not very long, 10, 20, 30,000 kilometers, and you would have a hole in, the, in one of the pistons. That was typical and not uncommon. I fitted a low pressure turbo. So it had a little wastegate uh, release spring. And as it released over 0.6 bar, it would actually spill the boost and but this would give me just enough to get around those trucks just enough to make the car ni- a lot nicer to drive although not more a lot more powerful a lot nicer to actually drive but i fitted an exhaust gas temperature sensor because to me what i've learned is of diesel engines if you're going to modify them you monitor that exhaust gas temperatures because that'll tell you everything there is that you really need to know about internal temperatures and if you overfuel or under air, that EGT will scream up, and that's the first thing that'll start cooking valves and piston and uh, piston heads. And I drove this, I did this modification, put the EGT, and it had a TJM bull bar on it, very nice. But the TJM bull bar has two orifices this big at the side of the number plate. So, so winch is down here two orifices and they're curved they're actually the edges are curved like a um, what would you call it It, it's air efficient a curved edge will let a lot more air through than a rigid edge so it assists in like the mouth of a trumpet sort of thing exactly precisely to allow air to it's far more efficient the number plate however was a little bit too wide and it cut off probably one quarter just one quarter, mind you, of both sides of these two important orifices, which of course, air going through to the water cooling radiator primarily. And I noticed that my EGTs were abnormally high and driving it and I would have a a little beep, 700 degrees, beep, I'd get a little warning, I'd just ease off a little bit, temperatures would come right down. I thought, why is this happening? I looked at this and I then took the number plate off. So now the orifices were clean, round and curved. Exhaust test temperature plummeted to normal just because of that edge, which was not more than this much. I mean, probably less than an inch on both sides. But because it was causing so much turbulence, which of course is invisible, the air wasn't and I'm talking about exhaust gas temperature, not water cooling temperature that it affected. It affects sure. everything. Sure. So I was absolutely so astonished. What you're, what you're doing with that is an example of what I would call uh, an empirical test, right? So you're experiencing some phenomenon and then you're playing with it 
to, and I, I'm not having a shot, like that's what we all do. The empirical testing is like this. You experience something, then you play with something, you see what the result is, right? And you just tweak it a bit to see what happens. That's totally cool. In, in R&D inside car manufacturers, everyone I think has heard of FEA, like finite element analysis. And what that is, is basically a process where a computer, you're designing, I don't know, a structural member, and a computer just cuts it into a thousand or a million, whatever, hundred thousand wafer thin slices and considers the edges kind of of each one of those and how they interact with their neighbors. And then you do that a hundred thousand times because that's what computers are good at. And then you arrive at a series of conclusions about the structural performance of a beam when you load it or something. They've got a similar thing for airflow which is called CFD, it stands for computational flow dynamics. So what they do is they get this little tiny sand grain sized differential element of air, like a, a tiny particle of air, and they can model its path of travel as it goes past something and through a radiator core and around an engine. And they do this routinely and it's like supremely boring work because it's just a whole bunch of numbers coming out of a computer. You have to be a proper propeller head to do it. But what it does to me, it, it, it paints a picture of what goes on inside uh, the skunk works of a car maker's R&D facility. And then you compare that to the nature of the testing that you just described. And there's a huge gulf in between them. And you can see things all the time on cars, if you know what to look for, that are the result of this CFD type testing. Like on a previous model, Lexus LX570, I never thought it would have aerodynamic anything about it, but they had little, they had little raised ridges on the insides of the uh, wing mirrors and they had the same sort of ridges right on the outsides of the rearmost pillars holding the roof up and these things were just little they call them vortex generators you see them on the wings of planes as well and what they do is they they note that they get stuck on essentially where or they're built into the the, the uh, external profile of the panel and when they get flow separation, like that turbulence that you were just talking about, they stick these little vortex generators on. And what that does is it sucks the turbulence back into, uh, to, back into the body. So it behaves more like what they call laminar flow, which is the opposite of turbulence. And basically it reduces the noise around wing mirrors and increases aerodynamic efficiency and reduces fuel consumption and, uh, all kinds of things of that nature. And this is this this kind of attention to detail is the absolute opposite of just sticking a dirty, big, fat light bar that occludes, I don't know, 30% of the uh, ram air kind of input into the cooling system of, a car, of the whole four-wheel drive. You know, there's, there's a gulf that separates these two things. It puts me in mind of... Um... When I see accessory shops fitting bull bars, they kind of, you know, if you look at a, a radiator, the way it's fitted to a car, it has, it has, um, you know, plastic, um, what would you call that material that makes sure the air is channeled and doesn't spill? Oh, yeah, it's uh, essentially just sealing in a duct. Yeah. It, it is, and it's normally very, very light. It feels very, very cheap, and it doesn't feel very important. <clears throat> So they fit a bull bar and these things get in the way. Hmm. So they just rip them off and throw them onto the, in, in the bin. And I say, hang on a minute, when a car is made, the manufacturers account for every single component. So that little piece of rubber plastic on everything with three holes in it and two little studs, all right, costs 89 cents. Well, that goes into the cost of the manufacturing of the car. Man car manufacturers, if there's something that they don't need, they don't fit it. Because if they're making a million cars over the car's life, that's, <clears throat> that's 89 cents times a million that they will lose in profit. So all of those little components to channel air efficiently to the radiators or the air conditioning, whatever it's doing, they're there for a reason. Why are you throwing them in the bin? 
but they do very commonly. Oh. This look, this is my problem with the aftermarket industry generally because they don't do the same level of R and D as car makers. And I don't want to seem like I'm so down on uh, the aftermarket industry because they do some great work. And as you've said, when you when you look at the quality of uh, a bull bar that ARB produces, like you look at the quality of the welds and the advanced fabrication techniques and things like that, I mean, we're not talking about a guy with an angle grinder and a MIG welder in his garage, you know, we're talking about a real high level CNC controlled um, manufacturing process that flows from a design input that acknowledges that you can do proper complex manufacturing and then assembly later. Like they're doing a good job. What I'm talking about is the uh, the detail of integration of these things with the vehicle. And it it's all kinds of modifications. It's like when uh, some cowboys take the EGR, for example, off a diesel engine. And most EGR has got a bad reputation, but it does some things that most people don't give it credit for, apart from making the air cleaner to breathe. It um, it increases the volumetric efficiency of the engine at low loads, for example, right? And if you blank off your EGR port, you lose that. And, like, it's not coming back. So it, it it's a pretty ham-fisted way to deal with something that is just often the result of a bunch of dudes sitting around a campfire going, oh, yeah, I blinked off me at EGR port, mate, and she's great now, kind of thing. Um, apart from that being illegal, it it also carries with it a kind of dark side, and the problem that they're often trying to solve has more to do with the, the PCV, like the positive crankcase ventilation system not filtering the greasy sort of oily mist uh, in an effective way, like before you suck those vapors through the inlet port and pump them back through the engine and burn them and make them cleaner it'd be a really good idea if there was a better uh, attention paid to actually separating as much oil out of those vapors as you can back at the uh, the outlet port of the crankcase before it gums up the inlet and then the egr comes through and bakes all of that crap on like that is absolutely an operational problem for many diesel engines but the ham-fisted solution is people sit around and they go i just blank it off mate she'll be right kind of thing and it doesn't solve the problem and it's illegal and it makes some aspects of the engine's operation worse so apart from that like great idea so what is your opinion generally on on catch cans that <clears throat> do this job that you're you 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 are you are you were saying needs to be done to clean that because I have one fitted to my vehicle. I go on a trip at six, seven thousand kilometers and I get half a cup of oil out of my uh, separator. Yeah, well, it's half a cup of oil that's not going into the uh, yeah. inlet port of the car, and that's that's yeah. going a good a good way to solving this problem. Look, the problem with catch cans is you can go to Amazon and buy one for 15 bucks oh. or something, right? Yes. And I'm tipping you didn't do that. I'm tipping you got a good quality catch can because if you're going to modify a system like that, you don't want it to fail in some obtuse way and turn itself into a vacuum pump that empties the sump at 100 k's an hour. That would be bad. Could so that happen? If, if your uh, catch can system malfunctioned in some way, I'm yeah. pretty sure it could fail uh, catastrophically like that, you know? Okay. Like, that would be rare, but that kind of thing, rare things happen when you yeah. deploy hundreds of thousands of them kind of thing. So yeah. th the point I'm trying to make is that not all catch cans and not all everything else are created equal. I mean, if you fit a good one, then happy days. If you fit a bad one, then something bad could flow from that because it's very difficult to just identify every conceivable failure mode that flows from making a change to a system because some of these changes seem trivial back to your number plate that's only you know, like this far over the uh, over the little trumpet air smoothing intake jigger on the car and then all of a sudden it's dogs and cats living together and you're likely to burn through the crown of one or more pistons which is catastrophic and expensive and inconvenient.
you know, particularly. So your <clears throat> in this situation, let's stick with cash cans. Yes, I've got a good one, a good manufacturer, and I understand how they work and how they need to work. And basically, I've just said to people when I fitted it, I said, if you're going to fit one, you must make sure that the air for the flow is better, not less. In other words, the pipes are the same or larger than what the manufacturer did, so the air can still flow at the same rate. Otherwise, you could get error signals and other issues and from a reputable manufacturer. But if I had a problem with my 4.5 V8, which is a, uh, otherwise pretty reliable engine, Toyota could turn around to me and say, mm -mm, look, you fitted that. Even though I know it's a good one, they could say, I'm sorry, that's caused your problem, even if it might not have caused your problem. Yeah, and this, this depends on the moral and ethical orientation of the car maker. See, consumers are used to talking, uh, are used to interacting with the world through a framework of morality and ethics. And uh, most of us would have a problem with behaving like a card carrying bastard, you know, breaking our ethical uh, contract with ourselves, kinds of thing, kind of thing, right? The uh, the problem is that. Corporations often don't feel this way. They spend a lot of money uh, on bullshit marketing that paints a picture of their virtue, but deeply at their core, their God is money. Like I'm not a religious dude at all, but they worship money, you know. No, and neither, it, neither, it neither. <laughs> I understand where you're coming from. It yes. is virtually a religion. They're, they're worship yes, money yes. and they, they have this, therefore they feel corporations are not, often bound by a code of ethical or moral conduct and they can essentially have a warranty and consumer law claim department uh, that is pretty Orwellian and its main function is to figure out what grounds we're going to use, on what grounds will we deny this particular claim and that particular claim. So if, for example, there's a photograph on Facebook of uh, I don't know, a performance car driving around a racetrack, then some car makers will use that as grounds for denying a warranty claim because you've participated in motorsport. Whether or not that caused the failure, like that's irrespective, but that's grounds for denying the claim. And if you've modified your engine by fitting your catch can or whatever, then that's grounds to deny your claim. And uh, Another failure mode for your catch can might be that some dude buys a 20 buck cash can, catch can from uh, Amazon and then fits it and hasn't really any trade experience and isn't particularly good at DIY and manages to cable tie it to exactly the wrong thing. And guess what? His all wheel drive burns to the ground because that thing got really hot and it's full of oil and it fell all over the hot exhaust manifold or the turbo housing or whatever, some hot component, and then the car burnt to the ground. And then that's like, ah, oh, no, we've had a look at the wreck and it's caused by a blah. Whether or not that actually happened that way, a car maker can deny that claim on that basis. So it really depends on whether or not that particular dealership and the car maker uh, standing behind it, really have a commitment to being reasonable and ethical and having a moral compass. And often with car makers, that's not the case. I mean, some are pretty good, but there's also a worrying number of car makers who are hell bent on denying claims simply because if you deny a claim, it turns into profit, doesn't it? You know, if an engine is destroyed and you can d deny the claim, then the dealer is ultimately going to be pretty happy about that because he can charge his markup on the engine and he can also charge you a higher labour rate for fitting it than he, the, he would be paid by the car maker for doing it. And for the car maker, he's getting paid for the engine and he's, um, he's pretty happy about that because if it's a consumer law job or a warranty job, he's just got to supply the parts and cop the cost on the chin. So it is in part just about the money. Mm. Probably a good time for me to get on to the, this, this warranty claim story that I think is a very good one. A friend of mine, uh, D4D Hilux, six years old, 230,000 kilometers, 
uh, had been using, it was, it was the Hilux on the Canning Stock trip, it was using a little bit more fuel. And we all thought because Heiner's just got a very heavy right foot and is a very happy-go-lucky kind of guy that, oh, well, he's carrying enough, it'll be fine. And then he said to me that it actually was getting worse and worse and worse. And then one day, lots of smoke and <clears throat> lots of noise. And and he got a, a, a checkup at the dealership and they said, well, <clears throat> this motor is actually subject to a known fault. And Toyota, if it has got a less than 250,000 kilometers on it, they will fit the bill for all the parts. They supplied him with a bottom, fully built bottom end, complete. And that was that came free. The dealer did charge for the work, which was not inconsiderable. But still, at 230,000, six years old, it's not a well-worn car, but it's a reasonable mileage. Um, and yet Toyota fitted the bill for, for the parts. And I thought, well, why did they do that? Because I, they knew it was a known problem. They accepted it was a known problem. And they've come up and said, well, because we've discovered this problem with that motor, we'll help owners. I thought that was a very really good story. Yeah, me too. Like, car makers aren't, they're not all Satan incarnate. You know what I mean? And there are plenty of good stories. I, I also get plenty of people reach out to me with good stories about this brand or that brand, and that's quite uplifting to hear about. But by the same token, there is a roll of the dice. There's a roll of the dice with the brand, and often I think it also depends on how hard the dealer actually advocates with the brand for you. And uh, then it's really just going to turn into are you dealing with a car maker who, who sees some value in mm. maintaining good, a good relationship with you? Because it, it's really strange to me how manufacturers, some of them at least, are more than willing to burn their whole relationship into the future with you in the service department in this way by denying claims. And I guess in my uh, position, I, I hear a lot more negative stories than good ones. And maybe maybe I don't get a particularly balanced perspective on the industry as a result of that, because happy people are less likely to reach out to me and say, hey, Brand X just did a great job for me. I'm more likely to be the recipient of those bastards, you know? emails that start off like that and then go rapidly downhill and they're about, you know, this long kind of thing. Like um, people don't... Keep, keep them short, mate. If you're going to if you're gonna complain, if you're going to go to John or me or whatever and you've got to think, keep them short. Keep oh, them short. Please. Because we'll read them. If they're short, we'll read them. Oh, yeah. Send them this long. We. It's very confronting to... Uh, <laughs> To be essentially to be asked to devote half an hour of your otherwise perfectly serviceable day to to read the granular detail of every phone call with a with a dealer. Like yeah. I just want to know the, the top line stuff. But some owners are completely whacked too because they will say, "My ten year old whatever only has three hundred thousand k's on the clock," and I'm going, "That's seven and a half laps of planet Earth." Machines wear out. And second law of thermodynamics says everything wears out. Everything's a clock. It's always later. You know, you get up in the morning, your face is a clock. It's always later. You know, eventually you see your father looking back at you. It's very concerning. <laughs> you know? Stop, so, stop, stop. I can see myself in the screen and all I can think about is my dad. Carry on. <laughs> You're right. It's a clock. It's right, exactly carry on. Right. Everyone's, everything is a clock. And it's always later and your car is no different. And the second law says, essentially, the second law of thermodynamics is kind of like the matrix. It's everywhere. And people don't understand it and there's a lot of mystique about it. But it really just says that things get more randomised over time, like there's less available energy and less order. And that's why when you buy a brand new car, it looks perfect and, you know, 15 years later, it's somehow less than that in, in the perfection and order domain and you're just looking at it visually, but all of its mechanical systems are 
uh, subject to this uh, disorder-based degradation as well. And there has to be a limit, I think, to when a car maker is obliged to reach around and offer you assistance because um, otherwise we're just denying the existence of the second law. I mean, ultimately, major repairs are going to beset every item of equipment on the planet and there's a point at which the manufacturer of those items is no longer responsible for that degradation and if you want to keep it running it's kind of on you every every piece of machinery no piece of machinery is perfect and all wear out as you say we we've just just finished it was earlier this year i bought a half a million kilometer land cruiser in south africa i knew it was a bit of a risk high mileage and i thought well let's do the story we had backing from terrain time we were going to give us lots of parts so that was going to help us and the and the mechanics last time we did something in south africa they just kept on calling me and saying can we do another one carry on so they were getting good value out of the coverage and everything and i was getting a beautifully built Land Cruiser, half a million kilometers, the gearbox, which should have been quite badly worn, was hardly worn at all. They were absolutely amazed, except for one component, the fifth gear. The fifth gear is a very small gear. And so, you know, if you're in, I've said, if you're in low range, don't use fifth gear low range in that, that gearbox. That little gear cannot take that. And that's mm. probably... In this case, wasn't why it was worn. The front diff still had the honing the honing marks on on the. I don't think it, this car had ever been put in forward drive, <laughs> but it had been used on a lot of gravel roads. You could see by the dust and everything, and the the the, the rear diff is a good strong diff. Front is not as strong; it's a bit weaker, it's used less. But re, again, rear diff in remarkably good condition, even though half a million. But the secret was it had a full maintenance check through its entire life. And that made all the difference in the world. The, world. the oils were replaced and it was, and any issues were corrected before they became big issues. But it was a worn vehicle and it was fascinating to see half a million kilometers. What does it do to the typically well-maintained vehicle? The body was in bad shape. <clears throat> I don't know if you saw the series. They'd used it for some kind of ambulance of some kind. I'm not sure exactly what they used it for, but they had changed the configuration in the load bay, taken out all the seats and replaced it with their seats. And there were 107 holes in the floor pan. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, <clears throat> so I gave the car a name. I called it Colin De. Colin, possibly De, because of all the holes. Well, so, that's... but again, it was, it was a... Um, you know, to say only 500,000, I think 500,000 is time to get rid of a car, not buy a new one. But Mate, in this case, five, it... 500,000 Ks is, the moon is closer than that. I think the moon is like 400,000 Ks away, 250,000 miles or something, you know. So essentially, it's driven to the moon and part of the way back. Like, there's a limit. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And the vehicle was definitely not loved, but it was well maintained. And nobody had fiddled and changed anything on it apart from the seats in the back. Engine drivetrain and everything, they had done absolutely nothing. And that's why actually mechanically it was in such good condition. In 2019, we bought a Land Cruiser, same kind of story. It was a 105, same gearbox, the, but the different transfer box because it was permanent, full-time four-wheel drive. Somebody had decided that it would be a good idea to make it a two-wheel drive Land Cruiser. That actually, can, can I show you something? You, you've not seen this. I've got, some, I've got something in. Just give me a moment. I get it. <clears throat> okay. I'm glad you're sitting down for this. Okay. <clears throat> what do you think that is? Okay. Let me just oh, get that. out of the way so the camera can focus on it. Well, that looks like something that's been uh, very hastily welded together in the pinion type domain of a differential or something. <laughs> yes, it's exactly what it is. It's a center differential pinion. And they had done that. <clears throat> Unbelievable. They had welded it into, made it into a two wheel drive vehicle. And what I didn't see, because I bought it blind, because 105s are very rare, the diesel kinds. I didn't see that it had free they had put in uh, uh, freewheeling front hubs 
So if you put a three wheel front hubs onto a full time four wheel drive vehicle and they are unlocked, if I had seen this oh. not bought at Bund and I'd seen those diffs, I would have walked away that instant. So, no, I'm not interested in this car. It's been butchered. So they had taken the full time four wheel drive system, put three wheel front hubs on it, which I so were unlocked and yet the car was driving but the center lock was not on which in case it should have just been spinning the prop shafts and not driving the car at all well the center lock was actually on they just used a different mechanism that was the center lock <laughs> that, that was the center lock yeah it was driving the two back wheels and no drive at all to the front prop shafts they had converted that land cruiser into a two-wheel drive and that cost it doesn't, a lot. It doesn't get better than that, does it? Like the, the that that is a pretty textbook, like award-winning modification right there. I love staggering. It. Mm. It, it, it floored when I saw it. It floored me, and I did a whole video on how how <laughs> converting a full-time four-wheel drive vehicle into a part-time four-wheel drive vehicle by fitting uh, front hubs is a you're taking a you're taking a vehicle that's designed in a certain way to operate in four wheel drive locked or unlocked center transmission that's how the whole vehicle was designed and all of those brilliant toyota engineers or from whoever manufacturer that you choose to buy your car from spent a lot of time developing that car and you and i are going to make i'm going to make concord wings shaped like this because well why not <laughs> That's like getting an F14 Tomcat and then fixing the wings out. So I can't, you know, go back to Delta Wing for high speed. It's just like, yeah, I want the wings out. We'll just put weld them yeah. shut. We'll, you yeah, know, look better. Anyway, that's I, love, the I, I just wonder, I'd, I'd love to, no, I wouldn't. But it would be interesting to be inside the head of the thought process, like to just to get a window, like a bird's eye view of the thought process that underpinned that, like, does someone actually say, oh, well, I've got a welder and I can get these hubs on eBay and uh, is there some way I can just use them to achieve my objective? And the objective was to save fuel. That was the objective oh. because it's known in the industry that full-time four-wheel drive vehicles use more fuel than part-time four-wheel drive vehicles. It is a fundamentally incorrect assumption. It's not true the difference in fuel consumption is so small i defy you to measure it and i've done my own tests yeah Not I, well it can't it, it can't be significant like if you know anything about physics it can't be significant because there, there might be a slight difference in the the hysteresis in the rubber on the front tires from um being pushed to being driven but everything else is still turning and therefore burning and dragging and all of that stuff you know like the that is one of the enduring myths, I get that, of the, the uh, off-road set, but it's complete crap. And the other, the other thing is how much time and effort and monetary cost did this fuel-saving modification actually take? Like you needed the parts and you needed the welder and you needed at least a couple of afternoons on the weekend to get it done. So... If only those powers and those resources had been used for good as opposed to evil, imagine what could have been achieved. It's an opportunity cost proposition, isn't it? Like it's it's an it's an absurdity. I did two tests myself in uh, one in a Land Cruiser and a mate of mine in a Pajero that has Super Select, and I've always claimed Super Select is nothing more than a marketing ploy. You can drive it in two wheel drive. You can drive it in four wheel drive with an open center transmission. And he was doing some work, and he had one of these vehicles, and he was doing. It was actually in Zambia and he was doing lots and lots of trips. And I said to him, do me a favor. Yeah, John, do me a favor. He said, you're doing all these like, like seven trips a, a, a week, like once a day. And do part of them in four wheel drive and part of them in two wheel drive and just measure the fuel consumption for me. <laughs> and I, he came back and he said, and there's no difference. There's absolutely no difference. There's no, uh, you know, there's no difference. And um, I did trips from, I lived in Cape Town and uh, I used to drive up to Johannesburg and I had a, a Land Cruiser with part-time four-wheel drive was my first, I think it was my very first Land Cruiser. And um, no difference in the fuel consumption because I would just lock the front hubs and drive it in two-wheel drive, obviously, because I don't have a center differential. So I'm driving in two-wheel drive, but I'm still spinning that front prop shaft diff and drive, you know, drive shafts. 
by locking the front hubs, driving it, and then unlocking them and driving it. The reason why Toyota put freewheel front hubs on their Toyota Land Cruisers is not to save fuel. It's to save wear and tear on the lighter duty front diff. Yeah, that so makes cars sense. cars last longer because the full-time four-wheel drive Toyotas have heavier front diffs because they're required over their life to do more work. People think it's for safe fuel. It's not safe fuel. Yeah, but you should have made you know more effort to track down the dudes who did that modification and just send them a thank you message, some sort of card, maybe a little uh, something to drink on a Friday evening because they just made your story so much better by virtue of doing that. Imagine oh. if... Imagine if that modification hadn't been there. Like that's that sort of thing is a gift. Because like for me, it's like um, I don't know. It's like when Volkswagen decides to um, to commit Dieselgate. Like mm. I love that. That it just and it gives you endless content. It's something you can talk about for years later, and it's, it it's and it never stops giving. It's it's just fantastic. So there should be more of that kind of thing, because. If there's nothing to like, if there's nothing exceptional, it's to to some extent um, what we do is capitalize on inversions of reality, right? Mm. Like the news does this as well all the time. Like um, the promo for the news: a man in custody after a woman brutally butchered in Bidwell, right? And Taronga Zoo welcomes a baby panda, kind of thing. But the the, the real story is that everyone got home, everyone else got home safe. You know what I mean? So it has to be an inversion of normalcy to get a run. And you just managed to trip over a weapons-grade inversion of what you expected to find with that vehicle. And it's like serendipitously, like, thank you so much. That's That's awesome for us. It's awesome for our team when that happens. It is absolutely, and that, that turned out to be one of the most successful series I've ever done. I arrived to collect the vehicle in a place called Mossel Bay, which is about five, five hours from Cape Town. I needed to drive it. So I went and looked at it, and I saw these front wheel hubs. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I went in, and I looked at the gearbox, and, uh, okay, I don't know what's going on here, but the car's driving. I need to drive it. So I went straight to the service station, put in fuel, opened the bonnet, checked the oil. There's no oil in the, in the engine. Of course. And if I had been inspecting the car, I would have run away three or four times. But I had spent the money. Here comes our series that we're going to shoot. We're going to develop the vehicle. And it was there were many, many, oh, holy crap moments in the workshop when we started. I knew it had a problem with the reverse gear. It was going cluck, cluck, cluck. I realized that there was something wrong, but that was the only thing that they did tell me about. But they you said think there was that a problem with you just think that somebody with the mechanical wherewithal to to do a CIG locker with a center diff and then fit some hubs, like lockable hubs, unlockable hubs, to the front uh, axles, you'd think they would know to put oil in the engine. You just would, wouldn't you? But your story got better. <laughs> like that made the story better. And once again, it's like if the sump had been you know, full of brand new oil and it'd be like yeah, yeah nothing to see here yeah absolutely and I, when i saw that it was just oh god what have i got so i poured in lots of oil made sure it was fine and i drove without without mission in two wheel drive all the way to to cape town and um the vehicle actually bodywork was in brilliant condition and it was fantastic and the engineering part the engine and everything was a bit of a mess you should have sent Toyota a thank you card as well for that excellent level of um, redundancy built into their centre differential to tolerate that kind of abuse without failure. And uh, I mean, everyone has gone above and beyond for you with that particular project, like the uh, dudes who butchered it and Toyota for their their redundancy. I mean, it, it is all above and beyond the call of duty. It's great. So what, rec what what would you recommend? If you, you, you talk about to, to uh, four-wheel drive accessories, um, guys who are buying a four-wheel drive, maybe they haven't got a lot of experience and they're thinking about, yeah, I want to I wanna go into the four-wheel drive scene because it really looks really, really cool and I love the accessories. 
where would you, what advice would you give them and where would you start? Obviously, okay. it depends on their mission, but generally speaking, for a general guy who wants to go camping, driving on the beach, fishing with his mates, and he wants to go four-wheeling. Okay, so I've done a million new vehicle launches, all kinds of new four-wheel drives and new cars, whatever, but the uh, proper all-terrain 4 by 4s always come with some kind of all-terrain demonstration or driving experience and uh, it's always shocked me how capable off-road your average all-terrain wagon or ute actually is like and the vehicles themselves are much more capable than the average driver and I know there's a class of person who buys these vehicles and uh, to some extent it is a fashion accessory that's what we're doing here um, to some extent and they kind of turn up at ARB and they go, oh, mate, I've got about 15 grand to spend and uh, just get started and I'll tell you when to stop kind of thing. And that's one way of doing it. But if you're actually talking about the capability of a vehicle, the bits of advice I would give someone would be to buy a vehicle that's as close to being capable of what you want to do with it in its standard form and therefore it will require the least number of modifications and that will allow you to launch off all of that very expensive R&D that a whole bunch of propeller heads already did for you back at the factory. And then the second thing I'd advise you to do if you're new to that is to upgrade the worst performing component in the whole vehicle four-wheel drive system which is the software that you're using to drive it because as you know you can get some people can do amazing things in standard vehicles and some people are just hopeless they're still hopeless despite ten thousand dollars worth of modifications of their uh, four-wheel drive right so uh, mark weber once said to me uh, this was in the context of racing but i was talking to him about his job and how demanding it is and things of that nature and he said well what he sees a, a lot because he he grew up like most elite drivers doing sort of grassroots motorsport and he saw a lot of people spending heaps of money on bigger turbos and different diff ratios and different springs and dampers and they were doing that despite the fact that they still couldn't drive the car that they had at the limit of its performance around a particular racetrack which is the job of the driver so i'd suggest that the draw the job of uh, four-wheel driving if you're actually going to just treat the all-terrain driving part of it like a vocation your job as the driver is to know what the limits of the machine are and then to be able to exploit the vehicle up to without exceeding those limits and if you get to a point where you're so good at this that you know where the limits are and you want to do more challenging stuff than that then modifications are entirely appropriate at that point and you should do the modifications that allow you to exploit these new limits but what i see happening in practice is a lot of people spending a lot of money on a lot of equipment despite the fact that they're still fairly mundane four-wheel drivers unable to exploit the performance envelope in front of them in the standard car so that's kind of where i'd come at it if we're not just talking about the hair and makeup and sexing it up so you fit into the club right four wheel drive training would be one of that would you uh, driver training Have yeah you, totally. uh, software upgrade number one thing and it, it's not just like it's not just four wheel driving it's all driving when you i don't know if i was going to go to the canning stock route i'd have to get there so I'd have to drive 4,000 kilometres across the country to get to, I don't know, Geraldton or something where you've got to start staging up for that. The, the, uh, the problem then is most of the driving I do is going to be on bitumen at 100 k's an hour. So I want to be pretty good at that because a lot can happen. In fact, I was doing an exercise once where we were driving a smart car, you know, one of those little tiny smart cars. We are doing that from... I forget, Melbourne, Sydney or Melbourne to Perth, you know, putting the smallest car in the biggest country kind of thing. And I was just part of the support uh, crew for that. And we're overtaking, I don't know, some old Land Cruiser or Patrol. And this is 
this is like uh, close to the border of South Australia and WA, so pretty much in the boonies. And there's the smart pulls out, and we're in the support car behind it. Smart pulls out to overtake, and the vehicle swerves heavily towards the smart as it draws up alongside, like it was close. And I've gone, what happened there? So where I was driving at that point in this van, and I'm like, my radar is up, you know, because is there some psycho driving this four-wheel drive? So we pull up alongside the four-wheel drive and a similar kind of little swerve happens as we get past it. Mum, with the dreadlocks, you know, has got her three- or four-year-old child sit, standing on the seat in front of her lap and he or she, I forget, the, the little kid is doing the steering and I'm going like play that funky banjo white boy you know this is the kind of crazy thing that happens when from time to time when you're driving in the boonies anything can happen and you need to be a good driver to be able to compensate for unexpected things of that nature and thankfully um, quite a a well-known motoring journalist was driving the smart Josh Dowling and uh, he's a really good driver and he did an excellent job reacting to the uh, the assault of a uh, four-year-old kid being taught to drive by mum. And then, uh, because, you know, I've done a lot of driver training and uh, my, my radar was up and I was expecting it anyway. So the point I'm making is that a lot of people would have crashed in that situation because they're unable to do those kinds of manoeuvres safely. And the crash might have been, you know, you you miss the vehicle that swerved to try to get you, mm. but you end up in the table drain and mm. or you end up having a crash with an oncoming car because you've in, you're in the table drain, then you regain control and a dirty big road, road train is coming the other way or something. And you've seen these kinds of things happen in the outback from time to time, right? So the software upgrade is one of the most underrated things that you can do if you're going to spend a huge proportion of the rest of your life driving but the trouble is with that i mean you're you're absolutely right but the trouble is with that and i speak for men generally we we're, we're we all know that we're good at doing thing doing the two things we're good at doing sex and we're good at doing driving <laughs> that's and, so true but <laughs> and and, uh, and <laughs> You have to get past that first. But not just good, Andrew. Excellent. Right? We're not just good. Oh, at it. you're right. You're We're right. Excellent. excellent. Yes, right? you're right. Like, what have I got? You see people at advanced driving courses. Typically, um, the, the funniest person at an advanced driving course is the dude whose boss has told him that he has to do an advanced driving course because he's there like, what have I got to learn? Um, I'm already awesome. And the first time you get them to do an emergency stop, they're like, no, through all the cones and, you know, it takes them 20 metres longer than anyone else to stop kind of thing. And they're discovering, yeah. they go on this voyage of discovery about actually I'm not shit hot at that. You know, it's amazing yeah. to see. Yeah, I remember a press event. It was actually with the Suzu 2. We were doing slaloms and there were, there were a whole lot of exercises you could do and um, a whole lot of presses. And I came stone last. I knocked over more cones than anybody else and at the end he said Andrew you've come stone last and I said I was doing it at 60 not 23 what was the point of doing it at 23 yeah, yeah. I wanted to see how fast I could do it and maintain that steering turns out not that fast yeah but look the other thing about the software upgrade is here's uh, two things okay if, if I'm in a social group and we're all um, mad keen four-wheel drivers, and I'm sure you can relate to that, if I get a new vehicle and I go and fit a bull bar and a winch and a roof rack and a rear wheel uh, second spare tyre carrier and a bunch of other things as well, dual battery set up, and you know, I tick a bunch of these boxes, and I've got something to talk about at the next barbecue, haven't I? I've got, I've got something to show the boys, and the boys are all going to, you know, stroke their beards over it. And, oh, mate, yeah, I can see there, you know, sort of thing. And 
if I do an advanced driving course, if I do a four wheel drive training course and just get better, or if I do an advanced driving course and learn how to swerve around a kangaroo or something, then I got nothing to show and tell. You know what I mean? If I if I go and I say, uh, look, I I went to this course and I learned what a shit driver I was and I got marginally better and now if I practice a lot, I might actually have some seriously better skills. They'll all look at you like, should we revoke his membership? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's not sexy, is what I'm saying. If you got, if you buy the hardware, it's freaking sexy. You've got something to show everyone. Yeah. I remember doing a course and it was set up by to Toyota South Africa used to do this thing every three or four years. They'd do the Toyota Armada, all their four drive products go down and they would actually teach. And it was quite a good idea actually to teach motoring journalists how to drive four wheel drives because most of them without that specialist skill were not totally good at it. They were reasonably good at many other things, but not particularly at that specific thing, four wheel drive overland, uh, off roading. Totally. And, um, but the driving school that was running this particular event, I had no respect for at all because I didn't think that they were doing things terribly well at all because of course, you know, I know, <laughs> I know better. <clears throat> But in this one situation, I had a um, situation where I remember it was a it was a Land Cruiser pickup, and very very steep, probably forty degrees. A forty degree climb is a seriously, I mean, you know what it's oh, like. So yeah. I've got to line myself up, and I've got this instructor. He's about seventeen years old, and he's. So what do you do? You answer me the question. What do you do? Do you listen and watch the spotter? and do exactly what the spotter tells you to do? Or do you say, no, I can also... Anyway, he's saying, come, 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 come. And I'm thinking, well, well there's a... Yeah, I think, isn't there a... Ho okay, I've... what do I do? I've got all these journos watching me. I must follow the spotter. Yeah. And the next thing, the car rolls like this and starts falling. Oh. All right? Now, the thing is up here that there's a there's a turn and there's a tight turn to do so I need to do a little bit of a swing to get the angle right so it starts going it starts going and I know that if I hit the brakes now I'm on my roof I have to keep going there is a um, the spotter right in front of the car and I'm calculating now roll the Land Cruiser <laughs> Ryan drive over the spotter so I decide, drive over the spotter. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And he deserved it anyway. It turns out that, I, and I corrected, and I got it, and I sorted it. And then he kind of staggered to his feet after falling over, and and, and <laughs> staggered up and said, "Oh, you're going to need, uh, you need low range, uh, second gear." And I said, "Actually, I'm just going to put it in first. I know low range is a second, but." I'm just going to put it in first because I don't like you anymore. And I put it in first and went up fine. That evening, the marketing director of Toy, we were, we were having a meal and we were, it was a buffet. And I mean, he came up behind me and he said, Andrew, we've got a ramp outside for you. What, what are you talking about? His name is Roger Houghton. What are you talking about, Roger? He said, we, got a, we want you to demo drive it for us. What are you talking about? And he said, we would like you to come right past the front of the hotel lobby on two wheels, please, all the way. I said, you're serious? He said, no, you were on two wheels. And we both in the, we were right behind you and we both went, oh, Christ. And you, you rescued it, but it was, you were on two wheels. I knew I was pretty close to being on two wheels, but I actually was on two wheels. Imagine how embarrassing. I wouldn't have been invited back. So close. But, yeah. yeah. And, Honestly, the instructors, some of them were very good. And this 17-year-old had probably, he, he was unqualified to, to direct traffic in a situation where you get it wrong and you fall over. Yeah. And that was a, an approved certificate, certified driving school. Well, at, I went very okay, good so there. at the other end of this spectrum, you've got mm. you know totally unqualified teenager. I remember back when Land Rover used to talk to me, I was at East North Castle doing in the middle of winter, doing this driving in the mud in an old style Defender, you know. And I had this instructor, and he he had a lot of grey hair. This instructor, right? My favourite kind of instructor. 
favorite kind of pilot gray hair still still with us kind of thing anyway he's used to shepherding various visiting media around the castle and doubtless you've been there but for, for any of your listeners who haven't been there the mud in east north castle is roughly equivalent to driving in tapioca kind of thing it's just really slushy and uh, quite challenging because you don't get very much practice at that in australia so anyway i'm having a crack at a couple of these different things and the the guy sitting next to me with all the gray hair because i was much younger then is just He's just basically telling me where to go and I'm just driving and I'm, I'm doing about uh, subjectively probably seven out of 10, you know. And then I say to him, hey, look, if you've got any tips for me and, you, you know, you can see some way that I could do this better, I'm completely receptive to you um, letting me know because, A, we don't get much of these sorts of conditions in Australia and I'm always up for learning something else. And he just, it's the first time he actually really engaged with me he went, he looked at me like that and he said, really? Like he's never heard a motoring journalist say that before. So I go, yeah, dude, really? And he goes, okay, well, I think you're just overdriving and you're in too low a gear. So why don't we have a crack at this one in sort of third gear low instead of second and just use less throttle? And I go, okay. And the vehicle just like, like I was using the force all of a sudden, like, mm. you know, um, and this is this is what I mean about like kind of being receptive to the, the software upgrade because you can you can be there and you can go, yeah, I can drive around here. And I was driving around there, but it's just a finesse thing. It's like when you get on a racetrack and a proper race driver sits next to you and and you know, just he's talking you around. And if you ask for advice or you you get them to demo it for you, you go, still a lot to learn, dude. You know, yeah, but yeah, and, and you can. It's not like programming a computer. You know, you can't you can't just download a software update and run it, and it's great. With um, with your own software, you just have to build it layer after layer after layer. It's like watching like a three D printer operating or something. Yeah, I am very cynical towards, um, as you can hear, <clears throat> towards off road driving schools. I'll give you another quick anecdote. It was Land Rover Experience. Discovery 2 had just been launched. I was given one for a day with an instructor driving a Defender. Very muddy bogs, very interesting drive. We were having a lot of fun, and um, the instructor got, stru got stuck. But the instructor and his girlfriend were both wearing bandanas, which is immediately kind of, yeah, you're, you, you, you're a bit of a poser, you know, and they got the, the the defender stuck. I don't consider getting it stuck being, you know, he bit of luck, maybe he ran out of talent, maybe he ran out of luck. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Got it stuck. And um, and the, the, the my, my discovery was behind him, so I couldn't help him out pulling him backwards. And he pulled out the winch and there was a tree right in front of him. So he wrapped around the tree and the winch went, nee. And the car didn't move because the, the battery was so weak. Even though the engine was running, the battery was very, very weak. So he tried it a few more times, and I said, uh, uh, I've got an idea. Man, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, 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 fine. As soon as you patronize me, I just, it just presses all the wrong buttons. So I offered to help it, and I said, I've got an idea. Eventually, he couldn't get out, and I said, don't tie it to that tree. Tie it to that tree. It was just a slight angle difference but it was much further away, double the distance away. He said, well, what? he didn't understand. I said, just, I said, please, we've been here for an hour. We're not getting anywhere. Humor me, humor me. Tied yeah. onto that tree. So he pulled it all the way up, tied onto the tree, and Artie's Land Rover came. And he said to me, I don't understand. I said, gearing, showed him the winch, said, you're pulling higher gear, Lower, it's pulling slower because the ratio is lower. Lower gear. He said, I've learned something new every day. And I said, hold on a minute. You're an instructor for the Land Rover Experience. Well, this see, is winching day one. Yeah, see, this is what people don't get about winches too. Like 
the performance of winches, right? That's um, grossly overstated because, as you say, you've got to be on the lowest um, uh, the, the lowest um, loop of cables on the drum to have the maximum mechanical advantage. But you can't use the majority of well, you can't use all of that cable on the lowest level because you need to maintain whatever it is, I forget, two or three different wraps yeah. just to have sufficient friction against yeah. the end stop, yeah. right? So yeah. the, winch is, the winch is only performing at its maximum in a situation where it's fully unwound to the extent that you can, and even then you can't use the, the full extent of cable on that level of the drum. And he didn't have a <clears throat> didn't have a snatch block, didn't have a didn't have a pulley, to because yeah. that would have solved the problem. Because double the length of line out, it would totally. have solved the gearing problem on two counts. And but he didn't have one, so that was the next best solution. But the, what's what staggered me is that he didn't understand it. He didn't understand this very basic thing. So um, I've been offered to um, go and shoot some stuff and do a story about a, a um, I can't remember what they call them X Drive. I think they're called their um, off road driving school in. I think they're in Brisbane or certainly in Queensland. And um, one part of me wants to do it and the other part of me is as cynical as hell about it because am I actually going to? And they're probably quite good, but so my prejudices are going to get in the way. Well, the, yeah, yeah, your prejudices might get in the way, but then if you go and do it and they're lousy, you might have to tell the truth. Heaven forbid, you know. Yeah, but then, um, I, seem, and then I come across like a know-it-all. yeah. Yeah, I know that it, it's a lose lose situation often, but um, yeah, I, I'm a, a little bit like you about a whole bunch of that driver training. I think it's just if you've done a lot of it and you already understand a lot of that stuff, some of the uh instructors in performance driving, well, like basic car control courses, they're uh really just sort of grassroots motorsport types, you know, and they 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 are probably good at explaining to complete novices how you stop in an emergency and how it's a really good idea to have both hands at nine and three on the wheel and look where you want the car to go. But if you've already got that all locked in, uh, the, the, the problem with being experienced and reasonably capable is that to get something out of being instructed, you need a higher caliber of instructor and you're mining from a smaller and smaller pool all the time. And I'm not, I'm not having a shot at uh, people doing basic training. It's just that, you know, you don't need to be a particularly high caliber instructor to deliver basic training, but as the, as the training climbs up the rungs, you need to be a better, you need to find better instructors, you know, and it's that you're mining from a smaller pool all the time. So if, I, so if I wanted to do, I would actually prefer to do a piece on on-road driving, advanced driving and high-speed driving. And I'm not saying high-speed driving because I want to drive fast, because if you learn racing lines and things like that, and I once spent a day with high-speed and I learned more that day, it was just fabulous. Just They were just talking about lines, weight distribution, left foot braking, all this kind of thing. Fantastic. I'd like to prefer, I'd prefer to do a story about and help people become better long distance drivers, high speed, long distance, heavy load towing and that kind of thing, drivers. Where, yeah. What would I do? What should I do, do you think, to do that? I think it starts with a basic car control course because I see a lot of four wheel drivers obviously got no idea about driving on the road, like performance driving. Performance driving is probably the wrong term. It's, it, performance driving is safer driving because you just learn all of these different skills. I mean, it is a revelation for some people to learn that it's a really good idea to have your hands on the wheel at nine and three. But, you know, there's a few hints about that because the thumb rests are there. Some ergonomicist put the thumb rests in exactly the same position in statistically every car that's been built for the past 20 years. They're only doing that for a reason. And there is this sort of... Um, uh, they make an apology to 10 to 2 by often having little lumps on the wheel, but you're really not supposed to hold the wheel at uh, 10 to 2. 9 and 3 gives you the maximum ergonomic benefit. But then it, driving, is, um, driving is oddly uh, physical, you know. It's not just a cerebral kind of pursuit. And 
you've got to – one of the things I see a lot of people failing at is because they've never been reasonably active their whole life. They haven't played contact sport or um, – don't have fight training or things of that nature where there are consequences when you're not on the ball, literally, is that these people who don't have that end up being bad drivers because there's an interplay between your brain and the physicality of driving. And people don't get that you have to lock yourself into the car. And I don't mean with the door. I mean, you have to lock your body into the seat and brace with your leg so that your frame of reference, you've got this accelerometer in your head, you've got to keep your head upright and not lean into the bends. You don't need to lean into the bends in a car because you're not going to gyroscopically precess the way you do when you ride a push bike or run around a corner or something. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep your accelerometer upright. You've got to lock yourself in place. You've got to look to the extent where you want the car to go and then everything just kind of falls into place then. And it's really about learning these basics. One of the most valuable skills that ordinary drivers don't have is that when something goes wrong, like you've got to swerve around something or um, you're skidding a little bit and skid control is hard to practice because where do you practice it? And it's, um, it's a perishable skill, but you can always be looking where you want the car to go. So if something goes wrong, car's skidding a little bit, if you're looking where you want the car to go, it's far more likely that it's going to end up there. The reason people clean up kangaroos or children often when they're in the middle of the road is because they look at the problem. They look at the and problem, look at the tree. Yeah, mm. you look at the look tree. Straight straight at the tree. Right? Mm. Like when you're playing contact sport or when you're boxing or something of that nature, you've got to, when you're boxing, you've got to keep slipping and you've got to keep looking for a uh, window of opportunity that opens. You know, your opponent's hand comes down and you can get over the top of that or to the side or something. And if you train yourself to think in this way and look for the opening, then it's just a natural extension not to get target fixation when you're driving a freaking car. And it really disappoints me that the uh, licensing process doesn't pay enough homage to this kind of thing because there's a lot of emphasis rightly so there's a lot of emphasis on rule compliance and what the signs all mean and how far from an intersection you have to indicate and things of this nature but they're not really going to save your life when the chips are down what's going to save your life is you stacking the deck in your favor like um, ha having your hands on the wheel looking as far down the road as possible identifying something that looks iffy and like getting off the gas like if you just get off the gas and cover the brake pedal when something looks iffy. When there's then a question mark looking. in your head, what's going on? Yes, yes. Yeah, you just, you've saved yourself a second, right? Just by having your foot moving, if your left foot brake or your right foot brake, it doesn't matter. I personally left foot brake all the time in an automatic. So if something looks iffy, I get my left foot and I take it off the footrest and I move it above the brake pedal. Like, off the bat, that saves me a second. Now, not even Mark Webber can break better than that. There's no other way that at 100 k's an hour, you're travelling 27.8 metres a second. So if you buy that second by moving your foot preemptively when something looks iffy, then you've just shaved nearly 28 metres off a particular stop. And it doesn't matter what sort of freaky ability you've got. You can be a Formula One driver, there's no other way to get that 28 metres. Foot has to be there. Have to buy that time early. So mm -hmm. it's the kind of driver training that really makes a big difference for long distance drivers because a lot of long distance drivers, they get, they're kind of leaning over this way and they've got their hand over here on the wheel and they've got their leg folded up underneath the seat because it's kind of uncomfortable to have it out there. And if you see something iffy and don't respond to it in that situation, it takes a lot of time to lift your sorry aging self up upright get your hands on the wheel and then straighten out your leg and put on top of the brake pedal and every second that you waste is 28 meters of mm. safety zone that you just burned good call i'm going to wrap this up with one last question john thank you for your time it's been great again um you recently did a story on my favorite vehicle now made worse <laughs> 
<laughs> I did. <laughs> of course, my favourite vehicle is the Land Rover Defender. Uh, I'm being sarcastic, those of you who can't see the look on my face and are listening to this podcast, because actually it's a, a wonderful piece of engineering. Lots of lots of very, very clever boffs designed that vehicle. Drives well, it's reasonably good on fuel, tows brilliantly, good, good payload, but it is, as I say, a catastrophic failure when it comes to an adventure vehicle, because if it breaks down, you, you, you basically need a laptop, a connection, and an internet connection to even recover from a flat battery. They have now released an EV version. Well, that's right. The plug-in hybrid Land Rover Defender, just what, just what every dyed-in-the-wall Defender fan has been waiting for eagerly all these decades, is a, a, a vehicle like that that you can now drive whatever it is, 40 Ks or something in EV mode and you can plug it in. So what they've done is increase the complexity of a vehicle that was already, as you say, catastrophically complex. Yes. And they've given it benefits, <laughs> benefits that nobody was gagging for that are completely, like my take on the new Defender, this latest Defender, is that it is a complete philosophical betrayal of everything that Defender previously stood for. So essentially, the only thing that carries over from its past is the badge. It's the name. That's it. Like everything else is completely different. And the the shining, the, the, the glacé cherry on the icing on the freaking cake of that betrayal is like a TFL Studios in the United States, a YouTube channel. They wanted a base model Defender just after it first came out. So they bought it and it was a non-starter. It, it was just it catastrophically failed on the way home kind of thing. And um, they ended up going through another two Defenders before they got one that they could actually road test. And this is not press test cars. These are This is a vehicle they bought themselves, right, to do some testing. And so anyway, this uh, second Defender, they... It wasn't exactly the spec that they wanted. So they wanted a bull bar and there was one available at the dealership. So they asked the dealer to fit the bull bar, which seems like a completely uh, reasonable request. And anyway, in the process of fitting the bull bar, they nicked the wiring harness, as you can, I, I guess. And that's not repairable. That's not a serviceable uh, component in the car. So they had to dispose, like Land Rover, took that car back and shuffled it off the mortal coil. And that meant the dudes from TFL Studios were on Defender number three before they... Which didn't have the right wheels that they wanted. It wasn't oh. the one that they wanted because they wanted to go off-road. Yeah. They got the luxury pack that they didn't want. So they actually... So their reviews were disappointing to them because they didn't. They wanted to test the off-road version, not the, the lump, uh, you know, luxury yeah. version. And when I see you um, doing your canning stock route uh, series, right, there's nothing you and your mates enjoyed more than sort of nooting up and getting under your vehicles and working on them every evening kind of thing. And I get that. It's part of the deal because canning stock route is extremely harsh on vehicles and running repairs need to be done. But you can imagine being in that situation with a car like that and just reaching up with some sort of pry bar to try and get something out that's jammed somewhere where it shouldn't be, some piece of wood that's come up and whatever, and just nicking the wiring harness in your Defender. And it's all over. It's not like you can just solder it back together. It's multiplexed and, you know, it's like a, a freaking disaster. And it seems to me just ridiculous to have a car that formerly was... Uh, aimed squarely in that camp at that kind of assignment and designing it in such a way that a, mine, a seemingly minor incident like some damage to a wiring harness can make the whole thing a throwaway. So it's already way too complex and they've made it a plug-in hybrid. We're getting it like three years late in Australia. They just launched it last week on the 19th or whatever. And the way they launched it was uh, 
in relation to this South by Southwest um, futurist um, conference thing that ran for a few days in Sydney and they got a rapper to be the ambassador for this vehicle and it's like such a philosophical betrayal of Defender. I, for my sins in a previous life, I have actually owned a Defender and I know how pathologically horrible its predecessor was to drive but in an odd way I actually enjoyed it in a sort of perverted way that I shouldn't publicly admit I'm sure but no you're you're absolutely right in a perverted way you really enjoyed it because what the vehicle was and what it promised was something valuable yeah in between the rattles and in there everything the terrible driving position it did promise something that was real and valuable which the new one fails to do let's look at the marketing hype i mean it was nauseating it was terrible like it was really terrible and they they made very few statements about the vehicle and Mm -hmm. they made a great many statements about music and parallels between the vehicle and i i'm frankly not seeing it and i'm also not seeing the environmental benefit of plug-in hybrid when the underlying vehicle weighs 2.3 tonnes. Like big heavy vehicles have more impact on the environment in fundamental ways. That's just how this is. So to me, making a vehicle like a Defender a plug-in hybrid is just a suck to virtue signalling. It doesn't achieve anything in the domain of net zero or climate change or, or any of that palaver it's just it's just a suck so that they can say oh look at our plug-in hybrid you know and th- th- they're claiming a fuel consumption of uh, of less than four liters per hundred kilometers i'm sorry a two and a half ton vehicle doesn't do that so no. how did they measure that well, it does, you know, low it, fuel consumption it, well it, you can't fudge the fuel consumption results but they're based on a laboratory test and the laboratory test has these predefined parameters. And unfortunately, the plug-in hybrid performs really well in the test in the way that it will not perform uh, so well in reality. As you say, in reality, plug-in hybrids, you know, 2.3 tonne vehicles, despite the plug-in hybrid powertrain, do not perform at four litres per hundred over the long term the, rate, the way the real world interacts mm. with the vehicle so the claims are accurate because they're really just a reflection of laboratory tests but they're not realistic they're not representative of what you could hope to achieve in reality but i think the market will be fooled by that because they're going to look at that astonishingly good fuel consumption figure and uh I, I, I can't I can't understand how it can be so good. I mean, if it was sitting at six or seven, I would say mm, this might be believable. The normal car is probably nine or ten. Six or seven would be a worthwhile increase. But when you tell me it's was it three three point six or something, or three point eight liters per hundred kilometers claimed, I immediately say forget it. You're lying to me. It's not performance is like three hundred kilowatts or something. You know, like you don't get a three hundred kilowatt vehicle that is. 2.3 tonnes and delivers four litres per hundred. It's just no. part of the reason this uh, sort of fudge happens is with a plug-in hybrid, it arrives for the test after being plugged in. So the battery is kind of full, you know. So that energy that's in the battery is not really accounted for during the test. You know what I mean? Like it just magically started the test with so, this, this major leg up. But if you go and drive, I don't know, a few hundred kilometres in that vehicle and then subjected it to the same test, it wouldn't perform like that because the battery would be fairly depleted. So you're saying that they probably tested that within the first 40 plus kilometres or so because they were using a lot of battery power together with the, uh, the, the petrol engine combined and they came up with a really cool figure. How did they get up to that figure? Because if they were just doing 40, 40 kilometres on battery, then it would be zero litres for 100 kilometres. Yeah, but, they're they're, on electric. but the, the, the tests happen according to a particular driving protocol. You can look it up. I forget what it is, but they don't. T- it doesn't actually take that long. I think it's about an hour of total driving for the city and the, and the, ex- the urban and extra urban, they call them, um, cycles. But 
the only way a vehicle like that can return a figure that is so low during that test is this, is if the uh, whatever it is 20 kilowatt hours or something of energy in the battery is giving it a massive leg up off the bat because otherwise it just it physically can't do that i mean that's mm. just not how it works and the mm. other thing is the tests are already spectacularly optimistic right if you take a conventional car and subject it to a lab standard fuel consumption test then it doesn't return economy figures anything like you will get in reality. It's always much more optimistic than that. And this leads to a tremendous uh, groundswell of dissatisfaction among some buyers who buy particular cars when they expect particular consumption and they don't return that. They're much worse than that. So dealers are sort of continuously being bombarded by a percentage of their customers who say, this car's got a problem. It's not delivering fuel consumption anything like you claimed in the brochure. But I think the plug-in hybrid takes that one step further by um, skewing the results because the battery is obviously charged up at the outset. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, John. It's been a good chat. Thank you again for your, for your time. Well, thank you um, for allowing me to inflict myself upon your listeners. There's nothing I enjoy more than, you know, just leading someone into submission like that. All right. <laughs> we'll do it again sometime. Let's come up with, this time uh, you come up with some ideas on what we should talk about. Anything you'd right. like I to will, talk about? I will do that. I'll go into ideas mode. I'll put my blue singlet on and get my crocodile Dundee hat and my thongs and pretend that I'm a hardcore four-wheel driver, not unlike your good self. And, uh, uh, okay, and then take them all useful. off again and then come back on. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> John. Thank you so much for listening to the Next Adventure podcast with me, Andrew St. Pierre White.